abrir agora para a primeira mesa com o tema Democracia em Crise, chamamos ao palco o senhor Adam Pcheworski e, para a mediação, a representante do SEBRAP, senhora Maria Hermínia Tavares de Almeida. Uma ótima conferência. É, boa noite. É, com alguma emoção e muita alegria que eu dou início à primeira atividade de comemoração dos 50 anos do SEBRAP. A emoção e alegria pela comemoração dos 50 anos, porque foi no SEBRAP que eu iniciei minha carreira acadêmica, e foi o SEBRAP que, de alguma maneira, abriu a possibilidade para as pessoas que, na minha geração, estavam saindo da universidade em plena uh, ditadura militar, de oferecer um horizonte, uma, 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 uma posição digna, uma saída digna naquela, naquela situação. E eu também estou muito feliz de estar aqui pela possibilidade de apresentar o Adam Chevorsky, que eu conheço há quase tanto tempo quanto os anos do, que o Sebrae está comemorando hoje, no mínimo uns 48 anos, né, Adam? Ah, cientista político, Adam graduou-se pela Universidade de Varsóvia, obteve seu doutorado na Universidade Northwestern, nos Estados Unidos, foi professor da, da Universidade de Missouri, da Faculdade Latino-Americana de Ciências Sociais, no Chile, onde nos conhecemos, da Universidade de Chicago e de muitas outras instituições mundo afora. E, atualmente, professor da Universidade de Nova York. Em 2001, recebeu, juntamente com colaboradores, o Woodrow Wilson Award, dado pela Associação Americana de Ciência Política, pelo, de, pelo livro Democracy and Development. Em 2010, recebeu aquele que é considerado o Nobel da Ciência Política, o Johann Schitt Prize in Political Science, que lhe foi conferido pela Universidade de Uppsala por elevar os padrões científicos na análise das relações entre democracia, capitalismo e desenvolvimento. O sociólogo Vilmar Faria, fundador do SEBRAP, e principal responsável por enraizar na instituição a cultura da pesquisa empírica rigorosa, assentada em métodos sofisticados no tratamento de dados, costumava pensar os problemas em termos de geração. E ele sempre me perguntava, bom, como vai ser a, a contribuição da nossa geração? Ah, por nossa geração, ele entendia o grupo de intelectuais progressistas, nascidos em algum momento da década dos 40, mais novos, portanto, que os fundadores do SEBRAP, e que jovens adultos tiveram que buscar seus caminhos pessoais e profissionais sob o autoritarismo não só no Brasil, mas em outras partes do mundo, onde visejavam diferentes formas de autocracia. Adam Chevorsky pertence a essa geração, que se formou em uma época em que a democracia era antes esperança do que realidade em muitas partes do mundo, esperança cuja realização parecia longínqua e problemática. Para quem se formou nessa época sombria, a paixão intelectual sempre foi indissociável do compromisso com a mudança política que requeria, de um lado, ocupar-se das grandes questões e, de outro, manter o equilíbrio sempre difícil entre o fazer acadêmico e o compromisso político. A Chevorsky é, de longe, o mais capaz dessa geração. Além de ter sido professor de alguns de nós, que sorte nós tivemos, é um mestre cujas ideias nos desafiam, cujo rigor, método e domínio dos instrumentos de análise nos fascinam. Sempre que eu termino a leitura de algum trabalho seu, eu me pergunto, puxa, como é que ele conseguiu fazer isso? É? Democracia é o grande tema da sua obra, espalhada por mais de dezenas de livros e outros tantos artigos. Graças a Adam, a conhecemos a natureza do compromisso que possibilitou compatibilizar capitalismo e democracia. Entendemos melhor o que acontece com partidos de esquerda antissistema quando começam a disputar eleições para valer. Ficamos sabendo que os processos de democratização podem ocorrer em qualquer ponto da vida de uma nação, 
como resultado dos conflitos e escolhas de grupos favoráveis e contrários ao status autoritário. Mas aprendemos também que é preciso ter atingido um certo nível de desenvolvimento econômico para que a democracia passe a ser uma opção preferida de todos os atores politicamente relevantes. Em seu último livro, a ser publicado em breve, Adam Chevosky discute com enorme riqueza de informação, rigor na análise e muita parcimônia nas conclusões, questão tão atual quanto inquietante, o da, a questão das crises da democracia contemporânea. É disso que ele vai nos falar hoje. Obrigada, Adam, por comemorar conosco 50 anos de SEBRAP, da única maneira que vale a pena, nos desafiando a continuar pensando grande. So I too have an emotional tie with Sevrapper, in part because of friends like Maria Arminia. Uh, I came for the first time in my life to Sao Paulo in 1971, which was what, two years after Sevrapper was formed, and had a great opportunity at a wonderful dinner in the house of Jairus Brandar Lopez to meet several of the original founders. Since then, I've been here in Sao Paulo many times, uh, sometimes for very good intellectual reasons, but sometimes I have to admit just to see old friends, some of whom I see here in this room. As you see from this brief autobiography, uh, I'm old, and what happens to people with age is that they develop expectations. They develop beliefs about what uh, should happen in the world, what should happen in elections, what governments should do and would not do in other aspects of social, political, economic life. And then it turns out these beliefs are suddenly shattered. Uh, I was talking before this meeting with Marta Ricci and Maria Emilia, and Marta said, well, I never expected that. And Maria Emilia said, we don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. So this is exactly what happened to me, yes. Uh, suddenly, I found myself bewildered. Yes. I'm not going to read it, you read it for yourself. But I started thinking, there's a, so many small, disparate things that are just bewildering, that shatter my well-established beliefs. And I think not just mine, but perhaps certainly of my generation, and perhaps of many of you. Things one would never expect, things one would find to be strange. My first conclusion was, it just does not make sense. But we intellectuals have this compulsion, Yes, more than that, perhaps that's really our task, namely, our task is to make sense. But that is not a simple endeavor. So I want to begin with a warning. It's a deceptive exercise, yes? Um, as Pangloss says in Voltaire's Scandidius, everything must have a cause. And if you read the waterfall of writings on crises of democracy, you immediately find that the first principle of dialectics is is confirmed that everything is related to everything else, yes? So everything immediately makes sense. Well, maybe yes, maybe not. In fact, tracing causes is an extraordinarily complex, technically difficult endeavor, so I'm going to be raising doubts. Moreover, it's not even clear what are the facts to be explained. Yes. Uh, which parties are the radical right parties? What is the marginal product of chief executive officers? Etc., etc. 
Uh, my former colleague at the University of Chicago, an eminent statistician, Leo Goldman, Goldman used to say, a fact, in fact, is quite abstract, yes? We make these facts, okay? So we have to be skeptical about them. To focus my bewilderment, I'm going to be asking questions about crisis of democracy in Europe and the yeah. I'm not going to say anything about Brazil, which is an intellectual deficiency. Obviously, it shows that something is wrong with what I was thinking when I was writing these, the book and then these notes. Um, as I started thinking about crises of democracy in Europe and the US, I paused at one time and I thought, well, well what about Latin America? And then I said, no, 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 things in Latin America are different. It seems that I was wrong, and I still don't know why. I still don't understand why. Part of the reason I'm here is, in fact, to hear from my friends in what way I'm wrong. Yes. And are they similar? Are they not similar? I have to warn you, I'm not going to try to persuade you of anything. I'm just going to ask lots of questions, show you a lot of pictures, uh, so it's at best a research agenda. I certainly provide no answers. I will leave you deeply discontent because I'm going to leave everything open. So crisis, let me just say very quickly because it's sort of a schema of analysis. Uh, democracy is in crisis if some conditions threaten its survival, the kind of standard theories or hypotheses you hear of this kind are that democracy is in danger if it uh, fails to generate some modicum of economic welfare, if it does not imbue people with confidence in its institutions, if it fails to maintain public order. How to tell? Typically, I think there are some signs of danger Obviously, there are conflicts. Yes. Some people benefit over the status quo. Some people want change. People have different values, putting different weights on liberty, equality, order, authority, etc. So conflicts are inevitable. And I believe that each crisis contains in itself uh, a set of potential solutions, and these solutions may be that the disaster disappears, that some partial tinkering works, that there is a gradual deterioration or a discrete collapse. The plan, and I have to warn you that I may be a little bit longer than I should be, uh, so I'm going to go fast, is I'm going to say just a few words about past history of crises, I'm going to delve deeper into what I think are current conditions, indications of crisis, and perhaps some potential causes of these uh, symptoms. And then I'm going to locate the present and the past to speculate and not more than speculate about the future. I'm going to, in particular, talk about the possibility of backsliding, which I see as the greatest danger for democracies. So let's talk about the past. I take democracies that existed after 1918 and which were consolidated in the sense that they experienced at least two partisan alternations in office as a result of elections, yes? So these are democracies in which the government changed as a result of elections uh, at least twice. There were 88 of them. And then I also do little case studies of Germany, Chile, US under Nixon, and France between 58 and 62. What do I learn from 
studying the cases of these democracies that fell or did not fall in the past. 11 of the 88 of these consolidated democracies collapsed in some discrete way since then. And I want to emphasize discrete way. I will return to it later. But these are yes, the only cases I consider here are cases in which it was obvious that the regime changed. As a matter of fact, we can attach a date to it. March 31st, 1933 in Weimar, Germany. Yes. March 31st, 1964. September 11th, 1973. There were some events that marked abruptly the regime change. That's what this material so far is going to be based on. What did I learn? One thing I learned is that past history of democracy really matters. Um, I have a paper which shows that the more alternation had occurred in the life of a particular democracy, by alternations I always mean change of partisan change of government resulting from elections. So the more alternations had occurred in the past, the more stable democracy is, the less likely it is to collapse. That really matters. Disasters of different kinds matter. Uh, income matters. I will return to it again. Uh, wealthier countries, uh, democracy is less likely to collapse in wealthier countries. Growth rate matters when you compare the democracies that fell and those that survived. Inequality matters again in a predicted way. So from here, you basically get what you would expect. Economic crises, kind of collapse of income by at least 10% in three consecutive years. They're dangerous to democracy, but not very dangerous. Uh, government crisis, the kind of institutional limbos in which it's not clear who has the right to govern are actually a little bit more dangerous than economic crises, but also not mortal. Signs, yes, there are all kinds of signs among those democracies that fell. Basically, they were anti-institutional, and in that epoch, it was anti-democratic movements and widespread violence by the state, against the state, and private between the groups. Institutions matter. Yes. Um, political paralysis, situations in which the government cannot govern, are extremely dangerous. This point goes to Juan Linz with regard to Weimar Germany, but it's also Chile, uh, true of Chile between 70 and 73, where there was a complete stalemate between the executive and the legislature. Um, institutions do matter. But the main lesson that I've learned from it is that conditions do not determine outcomes, that these historical events are extraordinarily contingent. Yes. You can always pose counterfactuals. What would have happened if uh, the communists decided to support more left candidate in the German election of 1925. Perhaps then Hindenburg would not have been president, he would not have appointed Branting, things perhaps, and that led to Hitler, things perhaps would have been different. What would happen by 1932? Fritz Stern, a foremost historian of Germany at one time says, by 1932 the collapse of democracy was inevitable, but the advent of fascism was not. So there was still presumably some choice. I, I think my main conclusion is that one can derive very little from these historical studies precisely for that reason. That what really matters is who does what when. So let's talk about the present and the symptoms of the crisis in the present. The first and foremost for me is uh, the erosion of the traditional party systems. When you look at Europe, 
what is striking is that the European party systems basically became consolidated in the mid-1920s. There was a major left of center party, there was a major right of center party, and then maybe some other small parties. And that system persisted for a very long time, as you'll see, and then began to crumble. Um, new parties appeared. By new parties, I mean parties that did not get 20% share of vote bet uh, between, uh, before 1925, and then passed that threshold of 20% later on. You will find that between 1924 and 1977, one in seven, six, it happened in one in 7.6 years. From 78 to now, one in 2.3 years, yes. So new parties kind of entered the electoral arena at a much faster pace. The number of effective parties uh, rose from three in 1960 to 3.9 as of 2014. Electoral volatility has increased between the established parties and two new parties. And then we all know we've witnessed the rise of nativist, anti-institutional, authoritarian parties, which I'm going to call the radical right. Uh, and finally, we witness a decline in turnout. Here is just one illustration. What you see here is the proportion of the parties that were the two top vote getters uh, around 1924 that remained as the two top vote getters since then. You see, where were two reduced their number from almost 100% to 85, 90%, yes, because some new basically left-wing parties entered the electorate with force, but the system remained at more than 80%, the same 80% of the parties that won, that were the leaders by 1924, were still leaders by 1960, and still by about 1999. And then, whoosh, you see a sudden collapse. At the same time, we see the rise of uh, radical right-wing parties. I show it separately, including Eastern Europe, and only for countries that were members of the OECD by year two. 2000. What is striking and different about this uh, period as opposed to the interwar period is that the rise of the right-wing parties or the increase in the share of the right-wing parties is associated with lower turnout. What I show you here are intra-country relations for 10 countries between electoral turnout and radical right vote share. Yes? The lower the turnout, the higher the radical right, with the exception of one particular country, Denmark, where there are only two relevant elections. Yes? So what this says is that um, the relative share of the radical right does not come from mobilizing people who did not vote before. It shows that the share increases because people who voted for the traditional center-left and center-right party withdrew from the electorate. The largest party among the French workers today is abstention. The issue which is intensely debated among political scientists is uh, whether this withdrawal occurs because uh, the two main parties basically became indistinguishable. Maraval has very beautiful data showing that the programmatically they've become almost indistinguishable, or because the traditional parties distanced themselves from voters on some other dimension. 
the second dimension argument goes back to Lipset, who claimed that the second dimension is authoritarianism. You can have left-wing Democrats, left-wing authoritarians, right-wing Democrats, right-wing uh, authoritarians. Uh, the general suspicion now, to which I return, is that the second dimension are postures toward immigration, racism, xenophobia, or some more broadly cultural factor. What it is, and whether it's truly independent of um, the traditional left-wing dimension, I don't think, it may vary from country to country, but within each country, there are big debates on this issue. One bewildering fact, which was not on my list, is that 70% of Europeans say that uh, the left-wing dimension is obsolete. And 90% of Europeans can locate themselves on the left-right dimension. So kind of what we learn from the surveys is extraordinarily unclear from that point of view. Is it left right dimension relevant? Is it not relevant? People say it's not relevant, but they see themselves in those terms. Um, the second question is, so why would the traditional parties let it happen? What is the dynamic of an electoral equilibrium situation uh, in which the traditional parties would not approach voters, would not do whatever is needed for them to maximize the probability of winning on that second dimension. Uh, here's just a small sample of debates on that topic. It's a small sample of these debates. It's extremely controversial within country studies, across country studies. I don't think we know. There is something, there is some new dimension but what is exactly its character is hard to tell. So what are the possible causes? I will first invite you to look at the left side of this um, picture. And uh, this is something which probably you have seen in several versions. Uh, here you have the dynamic of incomes of uh, people distinguished by um, top 40% of earners and uh, bottom 40% of earners. Yes. I say here post-2008 in Europe because the same is true in Europe. Anywhere you want to graph it, the income of people who have high income, 10%, particularly 1%, have been increasing and increased even post-2008 at a very rapid pace. The income of some between 20 and 40 percent of at the bottom of income recipients have been basically stagnant in the United States since the 19, late 1970s, uh, in Europe at least the last 10 years since 2008. Look at the right graph because that's something which I think is extremely profound. The last right graph shows that proportion of 30-year-olds that were financially better off than their parents at the age of 30. As you see in 1960, uh, 70, 90% of 30-year-old offsprings were better off financially than their parents. Now it's about 50%. Here are people's expectations. As you see, in the US, 60% of respondents say that they fear that their children will not be as well off financially as they are. In Europe, it's even more, 64%. In Latin America, it's understandably lower. Latin Americans are still relatively more optimistic. Causes. I'm going to go quickly now. All I can tell you, 
There are a lot of economists who say, well, 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 you know, deindustrialization, exports to China, that destroyed the industry, that destroyed stable, well-paying jobs. That's the real cause. Well, but then there are also other economists. Oh, yes, yeah. As you know, economists are people who always say, on the one hand, on the other hand, yes. Uh, so there is always on the other hand, and it turns out that if you control for domestic competition, destroying industry, then the effect of China disappears. If you start looking at, in general equilibrium terms, that is, you start concerning, uh, considering prices, then it turns out that, in fact, economic opening increases welfare rather than decrease welfare. So where we are, I don't know. Uh, a lot of people think that globalization causes inequality. There's a very b beautiful book by Helpman which shows argues and I think shows that this is not true. We don't know. Let's leave economists to argue that out. I do want you to keep in mind what is clear, as Danny Roderick emphasizes, that there are winners and there are losers. That much is true. Here I come to something which is close to my heart. As you see here, this, this is a picture of the productivity per worker and wage per worker. And see what happens about 1978. Yes. Before 1978, in the United States, as well as in Europe, wages grew at the same time as productivity. As a matter of fact, the elasticity of wages with regard to productivity was almost exactly one. And then what happens in 1978? The jaw opens out, and I think it's a jaw-opening picture, yes? Something suddenly breaks. The same is true in eight European countries later, as of 1899. The same jaw opens out. Now what happens, I think, is that, you know, what happens somewhere between mid-1930s and uh, which lasted until mid-1970s was something to which I refer as class compromise. And by this I mean unions and working class organizations and working class parties learned that they cannot abolish capitalism, they have to live with it, and that their future depends on being moderate. So they moderated their wage and other demands. Capitalists learned that they can live with those demands. And governments learn how to administer this compromise, to protect incomes, to stimulate investment. And then I think what you see here is just a collapse of this compromise, I think, under the push of a deliberate, premeditated, neoliberal offensive, uh, I think an autogolpe of the bourgeoisie. That's what I think neoliberalism was. And here you see the consequences. Another symptom are conflicts. And here I want to make a particular point. Namely, we often talk about polarization and we talk about polarization as the distance between what people ideally want. Yes? So say there are a lot of people who want taxes to be low and then a lot of people who want taxes to be high. The further, the bigger the mass and the further these rates which we would prefer, the more polarized is the society. And that's a traditional way of thinking about polarization. But there is another aspect um, of polarization, which I think was ignored, which is, so what, how do people who have particular different positions, how do they see each other, 
and what they are willing to do to each other. Yes? Uh, you may want very permissive abortion legislation. I may, may want very restrictive abortion legislation. But then the question becomes, if we differ, what do I think of you? What am I willing to do to you? So conflicts, I think, or polarization has these two dimensions. And I think what we've observed is not only polarization of ideal points, but also precisely kind of increased hostility between people if you control the distance between the ideal points. So what you see here on top is polarization in the United States and what is called their conservative liberal dimension, uh, where you have two parties, Republicans and Democrats. They're almost indistinguishable still in 2000, uh, 1994. They are beginning, beginning to see two peaks in 2004 and look how far away they are, the peaks are from each other now. Yes? So it seems that ideal positions of people, at least on that dimension, has really diverged. In Europe, this distribution tends to be trimodal. That means there's the little hill about center left, there's a big mass in the center, and the little bit hill on the center right. Moreover, there are no clear trends of polarization in Europe. It increased in some countries, decreased in a few countries, and remained the same in other countries. Immigration is a divisive issue. Um, here I show you attitudes toward immigration by supporters of political party in the United States, but the distribution of positions toward immigration is also bimodal in Europe. That means there is a big mass of people who say that having more immigrants is good for everybody, and there is a big mass of people saying that having immigrants is bad for everybody, and they are far apart. But this language of immigration, which is very much used by the right in Europe and in the United States, it's really misleading, and it hides something. Yes. The, this language, if you hear the right-wing politicians, whether President Trump or Madame Le Pen, it's all about control of our borders. Yes? Unless we control the flow of people across our borders, we're going to lose national sovereignty. No state can permit. But I don't think it's about the flow. As a matter of fact, before Trump came into power, there were more Mexicans leaving the United States from Mexico than coming from Mexico to the United States. So the effect of the war is going to keep Mexicans in, not to prevent them from coming. It's not about the flow. When Mrs. Le Pen says immigrants, when Trump says immigrants, they don't mean people who are crossing the border. They mean people who've been there for three generations. Yes. They mean Macabre, uh, North Africans, Arabs in the Paris of suburb who are there for three generations. That's what she means. I think that immigration is nothing but a code word for racism. So this is sort of what's happening, I think. But how are we going to make some sense of it? Um, it turns out that relating these factors in different ways at different levels produces different and not robust results. I'm going to take you very rapidly through some of the literature on this topic. I want to emphasize immediately the U.S. is an outlier. Yes. It's the party which is in power is radical right, is xenophobic, is racist, has all their authoritarian instincts. Um, 
has the longest period of economic stagnation by far. It's exceptionally unequal economically. It's exceptionally divided politically. It's religious. It's decaying in international sending, infrastructure, education, and health. There's a powerful recent study by Case and Deaton which shows that it's the only country among the developed countries where the life expectancy of full age white males has been declining. It's extraordinarily violent, private violence. And what matters is the only presidential system with indirect election. Yes, Mr. Trump won 48.5% of the popular vote and he is the president. Now, what happens when you start studying individual attitudes and individual voting tendencies? Economists, who as you know are imperialists, will immediately tell you, oh, economy explains all of that. So we're gonna look for economic attitudes that may explain right-wing postures. You can look for them among current conditions, and there are some people who find that, in fact, people's current financial condition affects their vote. Uh, you're going to find the same in this massive, beautiful study of 15 Western European countries over several years. They also find that current Experience in financial difficulties explains right-wing postures. There is another study of that kind. There is another study more moderate of that kind. This was about the impact of economic, current economic conditions. Other people argue it's not the current economic condition, but it's fear. And there you see that people who um, have something to lose and fear that they have something to lose are more likely to turn right. Um, Cates and Tucker say that only people who are concerned about the uh, future, um, who fear their future, vote right. Uh, Forsati finds that People who vote right are individuals in occupations uh, which experience high unemployment rates, so it's again fear. Here's a study which I find kind of very telling, which is uh, these people ask uh, across Europe, um, what do you think are the most important social tensions in your country? Uh, poor and rich, managers and workers, old and young, or racial and ethnic groups. And then it turns out that people who experience income difficulties, people who say, I experience income difficulties, uh, they're more likely to perceive such tensions. But on what dimension do you think? When people experience economic difficulties, on which of these dimensions do you think people focus? Ah, yes. Uh, if Marxist ideology were still powerful, it well probably would be owners and workers, uh, more populist, poor and rich. Uh, well, we have a conflict in old and young. If it's the racist ideology, it would be racial and ethnic difficulties. It turns out they perceive difficulties in all dimensions. I, my, I read this study as saying that they don't know who to blame. Yes, we don't have a clear image of the world which sort of tells them, here is where the culprits are. So they blame everybody. Now, then there are people who claim, no, 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 economy doesn't have much to do with it. And uh, you know, Engelhardt is the most prominent among them. Uh, and as you see, his explanation is something he calls cultural backlash. And then there's this pair of researchers who've done a lot of work on it, uh, and their explanation is 
sociotropic concerns about its cultural impacts. Now, I have to say, I think that this is nothing but just relabeling um, the phenomenon. Yes, they see people as being racist, and then they relabel it and call that new label the cause. I don't think these studies explain anything. So I think where we're left, in fact, is it turns out that economic factors in every study matter a little. They're always statistically significant, but they never add up to anything. In this, what I think is the best study, <coughs> the one I cited before, uh, Stani, uh, Colantone and Stani, Castani and Colantone, um, they study reg countries, regions, and individuals, and they find most important uh, regional differences, namely regions characterized by proportion of jobs due to uh, loss of jobs to China. And then they compare the regions in the top 25% of loss and regions in the bottom 25% of loss. What they find that the difference between them is eight-tenths of one percent of the vote. That means that if the German right-wing, new right-wing party, the AfD, got 12.3 percent of the vote, what they explain is the difference between 11.9 and 12.7. And where's the rest? Where does the rest of the impetus come from? I don't think we know. One topic of debate is, uh, so are these new postures, are they um, induced by other transformations, such as those that I have portrayed to you, or are they not? There are a lot of people show, who show that, yes, this is a beautiful study which shows that polarization in the US House of Representatives trails extremely closely, and it's kind of U-shaped income inequality. So basically, the claim there would be income inequality induces polarization. Uh, if you look at frequency of arrival of immigrants and anti-immigrant postures, that correlates very well in several countries. Not in all, but in several countries. Uh, so that's one hypothesis. But another hypothesis is that these attitudes have been always there. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm, you see these things in quotation marks because this is the way Americans used to call each other, yes? Kratz were Germans, Dagos were basically Mexicans, Spaniards, Japs were Japanese, I was a Polak, uh, so Italians were Spics, and these were all derogatory names. Well, you cannot use them. You could not use them anymore, yes? We successfully... Uh, repress them. So perhaps Jan Elster has a very beautiful little essay on the civilizing force of hypocrisy. Yes? So perhaps we've all been hypocrites and it had a civilizing effect. And now Mr. Trump just said, the hell is it? Okay. I'm going to call people the way I want. I'm going to say what I want. Uh, and people started using that language. Um, very interesting. Patriotism was a word you could not use in Germany or Japan until very recently. And part of the AfD's claim is, what's wrong with being a patriot, German patriot? If other people can be patriots, why can't Germany be patriots? So suddenly this word sprang back to the political language, and it's a dynamite word, yes? We know what German patriots, who they were and what they did, yes? That's why it was repressed for such a long time. Um, a paradoxical effect, actually observed by my daughter, to give her credit, is that I think what we're witnessing in the US at the moment is that the elimination of taboos by Trump on the right broke the taboos on the left. Now in the US, people call themselves socialists suddenly. Yeah, you couldn't call yourself socialist since McCarthy time. 
And now people competing for office. Actually, some of them even won office, call themselves socialists. And they advocate things, they say things that we're not saying in the past 20 or 30 years. As a matter of fact, I think the only country that I know when one can hear social democratic language today is in the US. So maybe taboos got broken on both sides. <clears throat> so the conclusion of my section is, so if it's not economic factors, then what makes people xenophobic? What makes them racist? And I, I don't know. I don't know. There are some very complex patterns one has to delve into. I have to say that the patterns of interaction between communities with different composition are extremely complex. One thing that we learn from them is that people who are exposed to people different from them learn to live with them in peace. The people who are most racist and most xenophobic in the United States and in France, because I know micro studies on that topic, are people who live in absolutely homogeneous communities on the border lines of mixed communities. That's where the fear is. So, the last section is about the future. Um, so, Fernando Limonge and I observed many years ago that uh, democracy survives in wealthy societies. Uh, no democracy ever fell by the time we wrote in a country wealthy in Argentina in 1976. Now one fell in Taiwan with a slightly high income, but the relationship remains. If you calculate the probability of democracy would abruptly collapse in the United States, given its income, it's as you see, 1.16 million. And I can tell you, I was asked this question, if you do it for Brazil, it's gonna be one in 100,000. Yes, Brazil already, income of Brazil is sufficiently high to make that probability very low. Um, probability that uh, democracy would fall in the United States given the number of past alternations is also zero. Uh, and uh, if I did that for Brazil, it wouldn't be zero, but it would be also very close to zero. So <clears throat> if you look at these general statistical patterns, there's no reason to worry about anything. But we're still nervous. <laughs> so why are we still nervous? I think either because there's something about the combination of current conditions that we really don't know the effects of, that we don't understand, or because maybe democracies are going to die in a different way, not abruptly as in the past, but kind of gradually and almost imperceptibly. So here is just, I don't know if tables help, help very much, but here's sort of a table that compares the past and the present. What you have in the column survive are the means of these variables uh, for those democracies that survive in the past, that is between 1918 and 2008. Then in the second column, those that fell, and you see those that survived had much higher income, had a higher growth rate, had a higher labor share, had a lower Gini before redistribution, lower Gini after redistribution. And then in the um, last two columns, you have conditions for con countries that were members of the OECD as of 2000, that export, excludes Eastern Europe and Mexico, uh, and the US. As you see, income now is higher than among countries that survive. Growth rate is after 2008 has been miserable. Yes. Labor share is low, but not as low as among countries that fell. Inequality is slightly higher than among countries that survived, but not that high. Gini net as well. The US looks worse on the measures of inequality than 
Europe. So let's look for what may be unprecedented. I think that the erosion of traditional party system, this kind of discombobulation, enmitement in French, kind of falling apart uh, of the party system, that's new. That party system survived uh, 70 years, 75 years, almost unchanged, and now it, it's just collapsing. Uh, income stagnation. So I was trying to figure out if this prolonged income stagnation is something unprecedented or not. We don't have good data for pre, uh, sorry, of lower incomes, of the lower 50%. We have aggregate data for income, but we don't have distribution data for pre-World War II. We have it for some particular countries, and when I start calculating, I come to the conclusion that at least for the past 100 years, the stagnation of lower incomes is unprecedented. Here, I think, is a big one. Just think of it. Probably since 1820, every generation believed, and believed for good reasons, that their children are going to be better off than they were. This, this belief in material progress and belief specifically in intergeneral, intergenerational material progress, I think it's a quintessence of our culture, of our civilization. So the collapse of these beliefs and supported by facts is, I think, both unprecedented and I find it particularly ominous. Class compromise, I will not repeat, it just collapsed. Polarization and hostility, they are not new. Weimar, Chile, 70, 73, but it's dangerous. So let me now just go into this topic. Um, yeah. As I said, past collapses of democracies were very discrete event, and regime changes were discrete event. Uh, when Fernando Limonji and I and some other people were classifying regimes we were doing it in the late 1990s, uh, we basically could say, these are democracies, these are non-democracies, and there were a few cases where we couldn't tell. We couldn't tell because history could not, did not provide us information about our criteria. Our case was Botswana, where the same party was in power then in 40 years, even though elections were competitive, unions were free, newspapers were free, so we didn't know would the government had left office had they lost or not. We didn't know what to do with it. We couldn't classify it. Well, what's happening now, I think, is, well, I'm just citing some of them. What's happening now is that it's hard to classify some of these countries. If you look at political science classifiers, of whom there are more and more every day, uh, and what they do to Venezuela, everybody does something different. Is Venezuela a democracy? Uh, is Turkey? Is Hungary? I think my native country still is, but it's hanging on a hair. That's new. I think the number of these cases which hold some kind of elections, observe all the democratic decorum, I'll talk about it in a second, has greatly increased. And therefore, the markers are no longer that clear. Why are they not clear? Because I think that the new phenomenon, what we learn from those countries that I have just described, and we're learning from the United States now, is uh, that you can subvert democracy by stealth, and I use here a sort of definition of a Hungarian, actually, writer, the use of legal mechanisms that exist in regimes with favorable democratic credentials for anti-democratic ends. Uh, that you can destroy democracy democratically. One of the shocks for me was, um, that it turns out it 
Americans, you can destroy democracy democratically, and it's sort of imperceptible. Yeah? I mean, In Poland, the parliamentary rules said that uh, the parliament must hold hearings on all bills proposed by the government. So what did the government do? They started to propose its bills as initi private initiatives of its members and not hold hearings on its legislation. You see, this, this is minor, 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 minor. Just nobody looks at it. And it's very profound, yes, because it means bills are not subject to discussion. Uh, another trick from Poland, which I very much like. So the parliament passed a law obliging the constitutional court to consider cases in the order in which they appear. Innocent, yes? What's wrong with that? What's the effect? The Supreme Court has a backlog, uh, the Constitutional Court has a backlog of about three and a half years. That means what? Well, that the government has three and a half years of discretion without being yes, the constitutionality of laws being reviewed by the court. And you can go on, and I, here I just kind of give it categorically, but one can go on and on and on and on, on about measures that appear perfectly democratic. And that end up in, I think, two, have two effects. Um, end up having two effects. One, they give the discretion to governments to do whatever they want. And two, they protect them from the possibility of defeat. You can reach those two states democratically. Um, this kind of process, this what I call subversion by stealth, hiding everything, yes? It puts a very high burden on citizens. Yes. So suppose, as Bilan Svolik does, I like that, two papers of him, um, that people care about some policy outcomes, they like some policies of the government, but they also care about democracy, and if they really anticipated and knew that what the government is doing may be good for them in the short run, but is going to have a cumulative effect of destroying democracy, then they would not have supported this government. But the burden put on citizens is enormous. It's, it's so hard to figure out whether that's really constitutional, unconstitutional, democratic, non-democratic. Not that all of these governments, note that all of these governments use Democratic language, yes. I am a Democrat. Everything I do is on behalf of democracy. So people would have to see through something that even constitutional lawyers cannot see through very often. Yes. So this is why I think that the kind of original optimism that starts with Montesquieu and then was very much propagated by Barry Weingast and then Jim Fearon, namely, Yes, they had this model in which uh, the government breaks the constitution, the constitution is the coordinating point, coordinating point for resistance. When the government breaks the constitution, all of us rise up in arms, go on the street, and the government is forced to go back. Well, I don't think it's true. I don't think it's true. I see few defenses. I see, see few institutional defenses. And I see it very difficult to mobilize people against this kind of backsliding government. And here is my last section. So what do I think is going to happen? Now I have to warn you, um, an economist now, late economist, Ken, Ken Boulding, once said that uh, the only function of economic forecasting is to make astrology respectable. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> that's where I'm going, okay? Uh, so what may happen? I'm gonna run very quickly on the economy, just show you some things here and then summarize. Um, uh, so the economic 
hope is that the economic situation is suddenly going to improve everywhere and the crisis is just going to evaporate. There are some indications that things may get better, but when you start looking systematically, it looks like things are going to get worse. Um, automation yes, is just replacing people from all kinds of jobs. In the past, it turns out that uh, for every job lost to automation, another job was created elsewhere. But now the forecasts are much more catastrophic. Yes, the, the new automation, the old automation replaced muscles by machines. The new one is replacing brains by machines. And uh, there was a very careful study by McKinsey Global Institute, which shows rather dismal uh, forecasts about I mean, growth of demand for labor due to automation. Moreover, yes, there is a rapid sectoral transformation in all the developed economies, basically from high productivity jobs to low productivity jobs. Uh, the sectors that are forecasted to grow at the fastest rate in the future are the sectors with lowest pay. So this is kind of the range of possibilities from the crisis evaporating because the economy will suddenly improve to gradually continuing and the disparity and stagnation of low incomes continuing. Where I want to stop a little bit longer is uh, about populism. Because uh, you know, this term is always used in such negative terms that I, it, it, made, it stopped me thinking. Let me put it this way. I think it's logically inconsistent to complain about persistent or growing inequality and complain about populism. Yes. If by populism you mean critique of traditional representative institutions, maybe even rejection of traditional representative institutions, then it's obvious that something must be wrong with those institutions. If these institutions function well under democracy, we would not have had the kind of inequality that we have. Obviously, they don't represent everybody. But they don't represent everybody equally. So, I don't think that we should just kind of dismiss populist critiques. Um, as you know, the agenda of institutional reforms is overflowing in Europe. There are ideas after ideas after ideas. Um, referendums are the greatest fashion. Then you get shorter terms, term limits. Uh, Cinque Stelle in Italy started with survey democracy. Now in France, actually, we're going to have a para legislature. 150 citizens elected randomly who are going to discuss the legislation on environment and make recommendations. There is a nice proposal in the last election in France uh, according to which if blank votes would win a plurality, then the election would be invalid and nobody who ran in the first, in the first election could run again. So there are all kinds of institutional innovations on the horizon. I think some of them are going to be accepted in some forms, particularly some kind of referendums and some kind of this kind of citizen consultative, randomly selected citizen consultative bodies, but I don't think that they're going to add up to anything. Uh, I don't think that they're going to change representation. Uh, so I think we're stuck. Uh, I think we're stuck with the institutions we have and maybe with little tinkering, but they are certainly not going to, institutional reforms are not going to resolve the current crisis. And finally, I think that accommodation to inter-immigration attitudes is also not going to appease the radical right, certainly. Yes. This is not about flow. This is about social compositions of society, uh, it's about social divisions. Uh, so I don't think that that's going to suddenly 
soften the right way. And finally, what I find ominous is that the situation, the political situation, cultural situation, social situation, seems to have deep social roots, that it's really penetrating the social fabric. Look here are some numbers from the US. Uh, so in 1965, 5% of Republicans and four of Democrats would have been unhappy if their offsprings married a supporter of an opposite party. Uh, by 2010, these numbers are 49 and 33. So you see the divisions yes, go down in the social structure. Let me just tell you an anecdote. Uh, the biggest family holiday in the United States uh, is the Thanksgiving. That is really when everybody where families reunite once a year. An average Thanksgiving dinner lasts two and a half hours. In the last Thanksgiving, if at the Thanksgiving dinner there were people who came from districts uh, that were won by different parties, so some people came from a Democratic district, traveled home, and some people from a Republican district travel home, the dinner lasted 30 minutes less. <laughs> People are afraid to talk politics. Yes. People are afraid of talk politics. You, I don't know if you have this experience, but I, I have it, particularly in, in France, that you kind of wait for some signals before you know whether you can talk politics or not. Yes. And I'm thinking about Chile. The rumors in Chile in 1971 was that uh, some bourgeois father expelled his daughter from home, not because she was pregnant, but because she supported agenda. Yeah, I will. So it's deep. Okay, so I'm finishing. So I think democracy works if the institutional system, basically elections, uh, absorb collective conflicts that arise in the society. If these conflicts are regulated according to rules, that means temporary losers affect, accept defeats. I think conditions for that system to work is that something must be at stake in the elections, but not too much must be at stake in elections. That if people learn that governments change and their lives do not change, they tend to withdraw. If people learn that being electorally defeated is extremely costly to them, they go to find other ways of defending themselves than organizations within the institutions. I think the losers must have a chance to win in the future. If the government is successful of to closing all the possible ways of winning in the future, people have no choice. Uh, the organizations which channel conflicts must be able to discipline their supporters. Yes, they must be able to tell the supporters on the street, but also off the street. I'm saying Maurice Torres, he was the French communist leader in 1936 who said, we have to know how to finish strikes. Yes, they have to be able to do that. Um, and between elections, there is a very nice paper by a former student of mine, Sebastian Sayeg, who is coming here, I think, next week, uh, which shows that people don't come out on the street when the government governs, but does not quite ignore the opposition. Uh, if the government cannot pass any legislation, you have unrest. If the government passes all its bills, you have unrest. So the government has to be able to govern, but not to dominate completely. You see the title there, Paper Stones, because this whole idea comes from an essay by Frederick Engels in 1895, who basically says, look, in the past, the only way the work workers could defend their interests was to use uh, uh, cobblestones. Uh, in French, the word is pavé, you know, the, the, you know, square street stones from which streets were built. You lifted them, you built a barricade, and you threw them at the cavalry. And Engels says, but now we vote. 
we can get our things by using a piece of paper rather than using stones. Yes? So votes are paper stones. What do you think, what is the situation now, I think? Divisions are deeply rooted in society. Representative institutions, I think, don't work well. Uh, I like very much the diagnosis by an American sort of journalist, political science, Julia Azari, that we, what we have is strong partisans, partisanship with weak parties. I don't think solutions are obvious. I think that that's where we are, that we are in kind of a Gramscian crisis. The old is dying and the new cannot be born. And in this interregnum, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. So a Polish saying is that uh, a pessimist is but an informed optimist. And I will just leave you with this perspective. I think what's happening on is not catastrophic. I don't think democ democracies are going to abruptly be subverted, abruptly die, but I think that this crisis is going to linger. At times, it's going to be ugly, and the solution is not around the corner. Thank you. Agradecemos ao senhor Adam Przeworski e à senhora Maria Hermínia pelas palavras de hoje. Okay.